Hi, my name is Mikkel uh, Rasmussen, and uh, this is my partner, Christian Masbjerg. And tomorrow we are launching a book called The Moment of Clarity. It's a pretty exciting book. It's about people. It's about how to understand people, how to understand who we are as people. Really understand your customers, not so much what they think what they want, but what they really want. But the book is also about how you can sometimes get people dramatically wrong, like really misunderstand who we are. And it happens all the, all the time. And um, I would like to start with a little story about kitchens. Um, and um, you know, most of us cook. A couple of years ago, I went to a, um, a conference called Kitchens of the Future. It was a super exciting conference where people were showing you know, lots of new technologies coming into the kitchen. And there was one presenter from IKEA together with um, a couple of Japanese technology companies. And they presented this vision of a future, a future kitchen. I think it's supposed to be in 2040. And uh, if you imagine you go into this kitchen in 2040, it's a, what's called a smart kitchen. So it recognizes you, it has face recognition, voice recognition. It can, uh, there's laser beams guiding you to how to cut the fish. There's a fridge with um, uh, herbs in that's grown to your health profile that's in the cloud. And if you look up in, in, in one of the corners, there's a little thing called a nanobot, which is basically a machine where you go and you say, I would like a tiramisu, for example, and it basically, out of nanomaterials, makes that, um, that, um, that cake for you. And I was completely um, energized by this vision. So, this is so great. There are still people having big ideas. Until um, somebody noticed that in 1956, there was a couple of people from General Motors actually doing the same exercising. But they, they were thinking, how will the f a a future kitchen look? but seen from the perspective of 1956. That means, how will the kitchen look in 2006? So now we can evaluate, really. So um, I want to play a little film that they made about the kitchen of the future in 1956. Can you play the movie? Baking a cake. But this was a kitchen like none I've seen. Put a card in the slot, and onto the screen pops a picture of just how your dish will look, plus all the ingredients you need to cook. No need for the bride to feel tragic. The rest is push button magic. So whether you bake or broil or stew, the Frigidaire kitchen does it all for you. Don't have to be chained to the stove all day. Just set the timer and you're on your way. Tick tock, tick tock. I'm free to have fun around the clock. My cake is ready. Time for the show. Everybody on stage. I think what's really interesting to think about is if you look at the core idea of the kitchen of tomorrow, as, if, as IKEA thought about it, and this idea, it's exactly the same idea. And the idea is cooking is slavery. We, I mean, technology can free us from making food, you know. It can do it for us, it can recognize who we are, and simply we, we just, we don't have to be tied to the kitchen all day as they uh, sing in this movie. And it's the same vision you see again in 2006. When we imagine the kitchen of the future, it's still a kitchen that's automated. We don't have to think about it. And um, it has a lot of technology that actually takes the human condition out of the whole thing of cooking. Now, if you're an anthropologist, that we work a lot with anthropologists, they would tell you that cooking is perhaps one of the most um, complicated things you can think about when it comes to the human 
condition of human behavior, that if you think about your own cooking habits, that they probably come from your childhood, uh, the, the nation you're from, the region you're from. It takes a lot of skill to cook. It's not so easy, and actually it's quite fun to cook. There's also a lot of improvisation. I don't know if you ever try to come home to a fridge and you just look into the fridge, and oh, there's a carrot and a, some milk and some white wine, and you figure it out, right? That is what cooking is like. It's a very human thing to do. And therefore, if you think about it, um, having anything that automates this for you, or decides for you, or improvises for you, um, is actually not doing anything to help you uh, with what you want to do, which is it's nice to cook. And, um, and therefore, if you make technology, for example, that has that core idea about who we are as people, that cooking is slavery and the idea is wrong, then your technology will fail. Not because of te 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 the technology, but because it simply gets people wrong. And this happens all the time. And uh, you cannot swing a cat these days without hitting a, um, a, you know, one of those refrigerator companies that make smart fridges. I don't know if you've ever seen them, like the intelligent fridge. There's so many of them that there is actually a website is called Fuck Your Internet Fridge, I'm sorry. <laughs> and it's a guy who every month he tracks failed prototypes on, on, inter on intelligent fridges. You know? And here you have April 2011, May 2000. And you can actually go in today and see, are there any failed internet fridges today? My guess is there probably is. Why? Because basically the idea is wrong. Not the technology, but the idea about who we are. That we do not want the, ki the kitchen to be automated for us. We want to, to cook. We want Japanese knives. We want complicated cooking. And so what we are saying here is not that technology is wrong as such. It's just you need to base it, especially when you innovate really big ideas, on something that's a true human insight. And the cooking uh, as slavery is not a true human insight, and therefore the prototypes will fail. Um, there are many uh, um, interesting ways to think about technology and cooking. For example, molecular cooking like this, where people experiment and broaden what cooking is and makes it more complicated, expands what we can do with cooking, as opposed to automating. So we're not saying there's something wrong with technology, but we're saying sometimes it's a good thing to understand what your core idea about the human behavior that you want to want to attack. Now, this is not relevant all the time. This is only relevant sometimes in a company. Uh, we have been working with really big companies for the last 20 years, and sometimes uh, there's a situation where um, things become really uncertain. We talk about it in the book as navigating in the fog. Here's an example. This is one of the biggest sports companies in the world, and I was attending a workshop where we talked about the future, and they were presenting sports shoes and tennis catchers and all kinds of technology. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this big discussion about design, product, innovation, uh, consumers, markets, there was a um, creative director who raised a question that made the room go completely quiet. And the question was, is yoga a sport? And it's a really weird question to ask yourself. But think about this company. This is a company, one of the biggest uh, sports producers in the world. And if you work there, you are surrounded by sport. You are, the people are doing sports all the time. They wear sports shoes, they play sports, they talk about sports. Even their language has sports metaphors built into it. Right? And the core idea behind that type of thinking is that sport is really about winning. It's about athleticism. It's about winning the marathons and so on. And that's, that's an idea that this company has also when they discuss in a workshop like this, I could clearly see it. So they would take up a shoe and say, so uh, what, is, what should the consumer get out of the shoe? And they would talk about that this shoe will make the consumer run a marathon two minutes faster. And that's super great. I, can, I remember there was even a swimming, a swimming um, uh, technology with, with some stripes on that supposedly would make you do a crawl a little bit faster, things like that. And it's great ideas if you want to win gold medals. But what this guy was discovering, slowly it was daunting on him, like an, an, an anxiety, is there's something big we are not getting right. There's something, I can't put my words to it, but the best way he could say it was to provoke these gentlemen and say, is yoga a sport? And what he was talking about was not yoga, it was the whole 
phenomena uh, uh, you know, around sport that he was questioning. He was seeing that there are now more fitness centers than post offices in every town in the world. He was seeing people doing 24-hour bike races. He was seeing the marathon times coming down with one hour on average because everyone now does a marathon. And he was basically seeing that sports was being democratized. And it's not only about winning gold medals, it's also about slimming yourself, feeling good about yourself, and things like that. But he had no way to say that to the company because he didn't really know how to voice it. And it was such a big problem for him that he really didn't know how to do it. And then, in this situation, th that's the situation where we would say this is the most important point where you need to get people right. If you get people right on this question, you get people uh, wrong, sorry, about this question, you get them wrong all the way through. So if you think about your own business, now we were in Google, but you could think about any other business, and you have problems that you deal with in your everyday, we would say there are three types of problems. Some of them require that you get people right, you're really strong in that, and some of them require that you can just use your intuition, especially if you're really familiar with the problem. So if you look at the three types of problems, we can start start at the bottom and say there are problems where it's not really so uncertain, we've tried it before, we are pretty predictable, and those are called knowns. You can basically put an algorithm to those problems. Things like if we put money from this channel to so that channel, we'll sell this much more. And that's something you can just use an MBA kind of thinking to do. It, they're good tools and good methods, and you don't have to get people so right, really. You can base on your, your decisions on, on, on assumptions about people. Then it becomes a little more you know, difficult, more unpredictable, and you go to what we call hypotheticals. And those are, you know what the problem is, but there are various ways that you could solve the problem. For example, um, we are putting more money into R&D, but we are not selling more. Why is that? And there could be various reasons for that. Um, also here, there are some good tools and methods that you can use from a business school. For example, calculating your way through it, figuring out how big are things, and so on. Uh, and then we get to the yoga question. What is yoga a sport? That's not a known, and it's not a hypothetical. It's what we'll call a big unknown. That there's something big you're uncertain about. And this is the point where you don't even know what the answer is, and you've never sold it before. And in the case of the sports company, this was the situation that to deal with this problem, they just couldn't calculate their way through the problem. They had to figure out, well, how is sports changing as such? When you're in this situation, there is something happening that we have seen in a lot of businesses, which is that we have assumptions about people that we're nearly born with, that we learn somehow, and they're really difficult to take off. And one of the biggest assumptions about people is this. Sorry, I'll just go on. That um, we can be understood as the smallest substances like atoms. So here's a physician that once said, everything is made of atoms. There's nothing living uh, that you cannot understand from the point of view that they're made of atoms according to the laws of physics. And I just have to say, really? Are we sure about that? If you take your own company, I could provoke you a little bit and say, could you take this quote and put bits in? Everything is made of bits, nothing, there's nothing living that you cannot understand uh, from the point of view of a bit or a calculation. And there's nothing wrong with thinking this way if you're familiar with what you're doing. It's by, by far the most efficient way to think about people, that we are basically atoms and you can reduce people to the smallest substance and then understand the totality from that. But when you're in a big unknown, this is toxic. Because what will happen is that you get people completely wrong, and then your ideas will end up as smart fridges that nobody wants, nobody buys, and nobody uses. OK. Now, we have um, seen that there is uh, many assumptions about people. There are five I just want to talk about. And then I'm going to hand it over to Christian, who will give you a little bit of a philosophical background be before this. And then we'll give you an idea of how to get out of this mess. But there are five assumptions. So think about when you talk about users, consumers, customers, what are you talking about? Very often, there's a, an idea that human beings um, are first and foremost thinking beings. That means you can understand people by scanning their brain. That's one very, very common assumption about people, that everything there is to know about you is in your brain. Another assumption is 
you know what you want. You, you, you know your intentions. That means you can go and ask a consumer, so would you like this in red or green? And they would actually know, right? Um, uh, a, a third assumption is that um, consumers, they're all about options and choices. So what you study is how do you make choices? So when you go out down to the supermarket and you want to buy a juice, do you want the juice with the little things in or the juice without the little things in, right? And that's a very, very important thing about consumers. The, first, the fourth thing that's um, uh, toxic is the assumption that your consumers, your customers, your users actually know what they want. Right? So you actually become kind of a slave to their needs. You just ask them, what do you want? Oh, I want a red car. Hey, let's produce a red car. You know, that kind of thinking. And the fifth one is that, um, that people, because you can understand it from the rain, uh, their brain and they have access to their inner minds, that they are the same regardless which social situation or mood they are in. These five assumptions, you may think that this is pretty banal or stupid or something like that, but these assumptions are um, at the core of many, many business decisions every single day that we make. When we ask people in a, in a focus group to evalu evaluate a, pro a product, for example, it's based on these assumptions. When we go and scan people's brains to figure out whether they like the red logo or the green logo, it's based on these assumptions. When we ask people, can you just evaluate what you want on a survey, it's based on these assumptions. And I would even have to say, sometimes when we do these big data analysis, you know, it's based on these assumptions. That you can take people and pull them down to what they need and put it together to a bigger question, and then here you, here you have the understanding of people. Now, this plays out in many interesting uh, places, and here's, here's an example of what can happen. So, um, in many companies, what they do is they do these big surveys about what people need, and then they try to data analyze, analyze their way through this, and they end up with what's called segments, you know. And here's an example. This is actually a um, spirits producer. They, do, they get us drunk, that's what they do. Um, and they looked at the Asian market and women, and they did a huge data analysis to figure out how many women are they, how old are they, what do they need. They did surveys, focus groups, everything, and boiled it down to four types of people. I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of them was called the modern life seeker. And they figured out those were the people who had the most money, who uh, loved to drink the most, and who we, who we wanted to go for. And, um, and uh, we were asked to go out in the supermarket and help them identify these people to, uh, to study them further, get a deep insight into who they were. But we didn't understand. I mean, my mom, she's not a modern life seeker. I know that. And my sister is not. And my daughter is not. I, I just couldn't figure out what is a modern life seeker. And we went out to the supermarket in Bangkok. And in this supermarket, it's the biggest in the world. It's the most Instagram, uh, sorry, uh, uh, shopping mall in the world. There are thick women and thin women, clever, smart, dumb. There are all types of women. And we asked, could you point out the modern life seeker? And they kind of started sweating and say, she's not here. <laughs> and you know why she's not here? Because she does not exist. Why does she not exist? Because it's based on the wrong assumptions on who we are. And it becomes a tool where you as a company can say, oh, our consumers are out here in a nice model, and we don't really have to be part of that. You know, we can just analyze them and tell them what they want. And there are many other examples of this going on. Maybe you should take over here. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what we see is the same research project in many different ways. So the research pro project is basically, as we try to write in the book, a Cartesian, a René Descartes-inspired project, which is that we have access to our inner states, we can, we can see what we want and need, and the mind is us, and the mind is the brain. Okay, So a set of reductions about who we are, and uh, if we look at the world, it's um, different, and we'll show you a little bit about that. But there's a couple of, of baseline things we see all the time. The first one is that you can get it down to algorithms. You can uh, create um, systems for understanding uh, the data that people generate in their activity. And if you take me, where I work, um, what I click on, where I'm with my phone, where I drive and so on, that's me. That's a very good picture of who I am and the kinds of decisions I make. The second one is atomized, that you can think of people as self-contained entities, that we are uh, basically uh, individual subjects that stand against objects and give meaning to the world in that way. And the last thing is that we're rational. Uh, everybody knows that uh, rational that we're not rational all the time, but it's something, and, and, and there's been 
economists that go a little further and say that irrational might be a category we could use as well. But basically, it's the rational irrational model. Um, and we think that's wrong. And I'll show you a picture here to explain what it is we mean. This is a picture from, um, from a project by a guy called Paul Ratcliffe. Um, and he asked people to take pictures of the best moment in a week, the time in the week that was best. And it's, uh, it's this lady, she sends a picture of umbrellas. And I think you know this kind of day in New York City where it's soaking wet and, and, um, and she lost her crappy umbrella. Her umbrella was destroyed by wind and she tried to trash it. And when she tried to trash it, she saw that that happened to others as well, which meant that the most um, absurdly annoying situation of, a, of getting completely soaked and um, losing your umbrella became delightful because it was funny. It's funny that other people were in the same situation. And I think you can also imagine what that situation is like because you've been there, right? So you're connected to humanity in a bigger way than just rational, rational processes. You're connected to humanity in the way that we understand each other. Uh, I was at an art museum in Los Angeles not long ago and I, I met this guy that was sitting on a bench crying and he looked at a big uh, Syrian um, tapestry, tapestry uh, from the 1600. And I asked him, so why are you crying? And he said, because I don't feel lonely anymore. I feel that somebody in a place I don't know, 400 years ago, felt exactly the same as me. So the picture was about paradise. And he just lost his mother. And he was thinking, where is she? What's going to happen to her? And somebody in a place completely distant, 400 years ago, had the exact same feelings as him. So he felt connected to humanity and he didn't feel atomized anymore. He felt connected to something. And that's a fairly deep um, insight if you think about it. It is uh, that we are first and foremost not thinking things, we're social things. We are geared into worlds and if you strip us of our world, we make no sense at all. We're not interesting at all. It is the, how we are in the world that is meaningful. And we navigate our world through familiarity. You know this, I guess, when you um, Go to a city you've never been to before. Everything looks new. Right now, the street you go down looks like the street to the baker or to the cleaner or something like that, uh, because you're so familiar with your own city. But when you move to some place, I moved to New York City from, from, from Denmark five years ago, and it's only now I understand how extremely Danish I am. <laughs> when, I, when I lived in Denmark, I didn't see it at all. I could, it wasn't at the forefront for me. I couldn't see it. In the same way when you stand in line for coffee, it's only when somebody breaks the rules of standing in line that you understand that there are rules for standing in line, right? So the, our familiarity with the world is how we find our way around. And that whole layer is not in the data, normally. The understanding of how we act upon the world and how we make sense of it. In the philosophical tradition, they call that understanding as opposed to knowledge. Knowledge is data in the way that you have a fair bit of data. But understanding is how you interpret that. Right? In, the, in the philosophical tradition, there's also been the debate about how do, you, how do you make sense of lots of data. And Francis Bacon, 400-ish years ago, said that the, 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 the conclusions will fall out of the data itself. If you look to the, if you look to the big data people, they will often say that, the, that we don't need theory anymore, we don't need interpretation anymore, because we have so much data now that they, it will conclude by itself. Okay? If this is true, you can't do that. You do it based on something. And it's only when you don't have familiarity with something that you need this kind of analysis that we're proposing. We um, basically are in the world already. We're always already in a world and we're always already making sense of it before it even happens. So we know that's a chair without taking our subjectivity and looking at the object and then seeing what it is. We just know it's a chair and we're very familiar with chairs. So what we say that there are three building blocks you need in order to be in situations where you're uh, where you, the business doesn't work, where you're not making sense. So if you, like you, uh, systematically launch products that gain, you know, one to two percent market share, you might want to think about it. Um, so the first thing is a humanized mindset. So a, a mindset about humanity that's different than the rational one. The second one is what we call thick data, which is data about our familiarity with the world. And the third thing is what we call non-linear problem solving. And I'll give you a couple of examples fast. 
The first one is we, call, we say that differences, there's a big difference between properties about something and aspects about something. The property of a woman is that she's a woman. You can say that that's biological. It's pretty clear that you can analyze that. You can use natural science methods to see that. The aspects about whether, uh, whether she's feminine or not is an aspect. It's a human thing. It's layered into our familiarity with the world. And what we are proposing is that lots of people miss the aspects by only focusing on the properties. And that's what you get when you use natural science methods understanding humanity. Thick data is trying to analyze what does something mean? How, is thing, how are things layered into our behavior? So for instance, if you go to a bar and you see an attractive person winking to you, at the bar, you would know in a, within a second, without even thinking about it, whether it's suggestive, ironic, critical, whatever kind of, of all the options a small, small movement with the eye can be. Understanding that and the understanding of how you easily gauge whether that wink is suggestive or not, means let's leave together or not, is important for your success at that, at that situation. And it's something you all know, but it's hard to analyze unless you get thick data. And the way we do that is we import it from the human sciences, so that is sociology, anthropology, and so on, that have methods in order to do this. And it analyzes what's below the threshold of awareness. Now, Miguel told, told you about before about sports. At the time, when we're talking about this company that is in the sports industry, they called fitness sports preparation. If you think about that for a moment, the reason why it's called sports preparation is, of course, that you prepare yourself to win gold medals. The only reason for going to the gym or doing yoga or anything like that can only be, if you are in the mindset that sports is about winning, is to prepare yourself for something real instead of the, you know, just going to the gym. And what we found when we looked at these things was we, we found what, in this case, we call it the little black dress phenomenon. But it was basically a fissure, a, um, a fitness measure, measurement tool for women that we found across generation, across, um, across geography, which was a, a dress that was a little bit too small. Uh, so it was an ambition and it was layered into the whole, the whole reason they did what they did was that was embodied in that dress. And that's the kind of data that we call thick data. It's not, um, it's not the kind of data I guess you work with the most. And we're not saying that that's any, in any way wrong. We're just saying this is another type of data that can be very, very helpful if you don't have familiarity with an area. Um, so the, we, what we call default thinking Hypothesis-based inquiry um, answers what and how much. Uh, research on what is and has been or is happening right now. Um, and what we're saying is that there's another type, and we, we call it sense-making in the book, is an, is an exploratory inquiry. You're not basing yourself on, you're not uh, trying to test a hypothesis. You're uh, trying to cast a net and understand patterns of, of behavior. And in the bottom, you can see the difference between correctness and truth. This is a classic Martin Heidegger distinction. He says there's lots of things that are correct, but that isn't true. So for instance, if I ask my daughter, uh, could you please put six, uh, six um, plates on the table? She would go and put six plates on the table. Uh, and I'll come in and they're all in a stack. And I'll say, well, that's not what I meant. I meant around the table with forks and knives and stuff. And she would say, well, six. <laughs> that, so it's completely correct, there are six plates on the table, but that's not the truth about how you eat together, in a sense. Uh, and what we're trying to, get to say is that, that there is a method for getting to that shared, common, humanity truth about us. You want to say something? Yes. And um, I just want to show you how one company works with this. It's a company that uh, many of you know well, it's Lego. And uh, many years ago, they were in trouble um, because um, they were losing money, but also they were um, expanding into territories that they didn't know so well. And somehow they got people wrong. Um, at that time, when um, we met uh, Lego, um, they had some pretty strong assumption about what's going to happen to play. And then um, one of them is, we're going to die because PlayStation is going to take it all. Another one was, um, a phenomenon called instant traction. Have you heard about this? The idea is that kids these days, 
They have no attention. You can't get them to do anything. So when you go into a toy store, the toy needs to be very noisy and very easy to play with, because that's the only way you can get their attention. Um, uh, they also had a creativity idea, which was called crisp, cool, wow. And there was anything was evaluated on, is it crisp, is it cool, or is it white? Nobody knew what it meant. But is it crisp, cool, or wow? Right. So that means you can just do anything. Um, that boys wanted evil, so you can see when they did Bionicle that it is dark and red and blood and you know, death. Uh, and that girls wanted pink, and you can see that you know, it was pink princess, everything was pink and so on. And basically they assumed that because of this, the brick has no future. We have to head, head in another direction. And they did that by launching a lot of new innovations that was beyond the brick. Software and toothbrushes and violent toys and all kinds of things. And it basically got them into trouble. Um, they got a new CEO who um, at one point said, I think we need to understand before we take any decisions, um, why do kids play? And what role do we play in that? And, um, and the first step in getting the human condition right, like Christian was talking about, is not really doing any research, or meeting any consumers or anything like that. It's looking at the assumptions you have and trying to change the question. And we talk about this as framing your problem as a phenomena. And that's a very academic way of saying it. A simpler way is try to ask your business question in a way that a p person can experience. So for example, the big business question for Lego at that point was, how can we sell more toys? It's a very natural, very good question. It's just that it's not something anybody experiences. And what they did is change that around to a question which was, why do kids play? It's a very simple little trick, but it does wonder because you start looking at very different um, behaviors when you look at why do kids play. It's actually a little tricky if you look at a kid, why do they play? Jesus, I don't know why they play, they just do it, you know. Yeah, but why do they play? And what Lego did was they spent half a year going out to kids, living with kids, observing kids, figuring out what's their world like, figuring out parents, figuring out how school works, and trying to go down to that thick data that could reveal why do kids play and then try to make sense of that to find their own future. Now, um, this was a really interesting experience and lots of interesting stories. Here's one of them. Um, this is a shoe worn by a, bo a boy in, um, in Germany, I believe. And the shoe is um, a thousand times more worth for him than a new shoe. And we ask him why, and he says, because it's worn in the right places, it shows that I can do a kick flipper. This shoe is worn in the right place because he has tried a million times to do the trick on the skateboard that makes him stand out in the hierarchy among his friends. And if you look at that, it really means that he does not suffer from attention span or loss of mastery or de-skilling or anything like that. This kid is deeply into one thing and he does it every day for hours and hours and hours and hours. And what Lego found was all the kids they, may, they, they met had this deep mastery of something. They met one little guy who knew everything about sharks. So he was building a shark in Lego, and they asked him, so what shark? Oh, it's, it's the one with the 23 teeth, you know, because there's one shark that has that, and he, he knew the whole history of, of sharks. Um, yes. Now, they also found another interesting thing, which was that, um, a lot of kids, when you play with them, not talk to them, um, they reveal a big world of inside knowledge that we don't know as adults. We call it under the radar. We don't know it's there. So here's an example. It's a, it's a German boy who, um, who Lego met. And they, um, uh, his, the, his mom told them that this boy um, was really bad at maths. He was not going to, to go to school, probably had HDHD and so on, and she was kind of worried about him. And to show that, she had given him a trumpet. Do you think he was playing on the trumpet? Not really, but what he was doing was, he was doing something called fantasy football. And we observed that, and he was sitting with a big piece of paper, and then he was 
in, in like in soccer. So he's going, and Luftkicker was going, and he was coming up with these imaginary football teams, imaginary players. And then he would make a statistic after 90 minutes of playing the game about who won. But not only that, he would also make probabilities of if you put your money on Luftkicker against Litana, it's probably a nine to one, right? So here's a kid where his mom and probably his school and all the psychologists in the world would say, he suffers from attention span. He's not good at maths. We are worried about him. But what Lego discovered was that behind all that, there was a kid who had so much talent and so much mastery, it's just nobody was seeing it. Um, they took this insight and um, really thought about what does it mean for us. And basically, um, they saw three big things. One was kids have mastery and they strive for mastery. Anything that's difficult and complex and deep is great for kids. The other thing, this was the thing with the shoe and the skateboard, is that a lot of kids these days are looking for hierarchy. Uh, meaning, if you ask any kid, so who's best at maths in your class? She, she will say, oh, that's Jim. And who's number 17? Um, that's Jack. Uh, ask any European kid, uh, you know, so uh, which Italian player scored the most goals three years ago? They'd know. Uh, and so they are, we found hierarchies everywhere, everywhere. So mastery and hierarchy. And, um, and the last thing was um, the sensation of building something uh, big and complex and uh, challenging. If you looked at those three things, and just think about, so, so we're moving into girls' uh, toys, we're moving into toothbrushes, violent toys, stories with a lot of storytelling, and we're moving ourselves away from the core experience of building something, creating something. And you look at the three things that kids really need, which is mastery, hierarchy, and challenges. Lego found, but maybe the answer is just right here in front of us, and it's called a brick. Because a brick can give you mastery. A brick can give you hierarchy if you build something and show other people. And a brick can give you a challenge. And if there was a way we could put that idea into our, all the things we're doing, all the innovations we're coming up with, all the products we're coming up with, the way our shops look, the way our digital tools are going to look. And they took that in that that very idea back to the brick and mastery, uh, hierarchy and challenges, and put it into their core offerings. So they created tools where uh, kids could design their own Lego and get it printed. Basically, they created Lego games that gave you uh, skill and hierarchy, and they went into the digital universe with a much bigger precision than they could before. And if you ask the CEO, he says. Today, you know, they are number two uh, toy company in the world. They're really profitable and successful. And not only because of that, but also because of that. If you ask him, he would say, well, there are two reasons. One is that we um, basically did the hygiene on the company, and we now have cost control, and we know where we're making money, and all that you can learn in an MBA. So that was one thing. And the other thing was that now we understand why kids play. Hierarchy, mastery, and challenges. And we can put that in to everything we do. OK. So that's the story about how, how, how to do that. And in this book, we say there is a generic method behind this that any company could learn, any company can do, if you do it right. If you start by framing your question as a phenomenon, then you dig into how people really are, how they really live, and get a thick understanding of that. Then you find the patterns in that and say, what are the interesting patterns? And then you say, what are the consequences for our business? And then you frame that as an idea that can create impact for your business. That's basically the simple way of doing it. It's really simple to say. It's not so easy to do, but it is simple to say. Because I just did it. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So really what we are saying is we think that in an age of a lot of big data and a lot of rational thinking, there is a need also for getting a little bit of humanity into business again. And there is a science of understanding people. It's called human science, anthropology, social science, political science, parts of economics, literature, um, linguistics, that has you know 100 to 200 years tradition of understanding people. And all they're really saying is there is 
something about us that's not on the surface, that can only be discovered if we kind of reveal it. And I think the, one of the most emotional moments for me when, when I wrote this book was when I was listening to a song. I write and listen to songs at the same time. And there was this song by uh, Tom Waits, um, which is called San Diego uh, Serenade. And he uh, sings about how, um, he, how um, he never saw the morning until he stayed up all night. And I can remember that from when I was a teenager, the first time I went out to a party and came home, and the birds were singing, it was in the summer, and I could just feel the sensation of what a morning really is. I never saw that before, and that's what he's singing about. He sings about, I never saw the sunshine until um, you turned out the light. He says, I never saw my home time until I stayed away too long. And then he's saying, I, I, I never heard a melody until I needed a song. And that's the very simple message that we have for you guys, that there is a way to get both the top layers of our experience as humans, but also get to the deeper layers, and both are needed in the future. Thanks a lot. <laughs> what do you do now? <laughs> Any questions? Hi, thanks for joining us. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you identify the right question to ask? Mm -hmm. um, so sort of the process of getting to the why do kids play? Mm -hmm. What's that like? See, this is a really good question. And it's interesting because we, we got that question a few times before. And uh, the literature doesn't reveal anything. Uh, so our main inspirations, which are German philosophers, basically, so Martin Heidegger, later on French philosophers, have no method to do this. Uh, the way we do that is to we turn it into a verb. So we say, what's the main, most banal, we call average everyday experience of pe that people have here? And, and then say, what's, what's, what might that be like? Right? So, so we say, what's the average everyday practice that people have? And are there interesting and juicy uh, questions that once you think about it, once you think about play, I mean, I know kids play, but I don't really know why. Uh, and if we don't know why, how can we ever, ever produce toys that are helpful in that case? Uh, why do people work out? Right? Uh, so it's, it's, it's so dumb and, and um, average everyday and intuitive that people in the beginning feel, well, what does that mean? And the way that the tradition talks about this is as a phenomenon. That's also why the, the philosophy behind this is called phenomenology. So it's what's the human phenomenon that we can all share and all experience and that's so close to us that we never see it. It's like glass, wearing glasses, maybe not Google glasses, but any, any old glasses uh, that, you, um, that you don't uh, think much about. So it's, like I said before, you don't think about, when you go out to the, what, what is called a, a mini kitchen, which is a fairly large kitchen, but uh, if you go out there and there are many people around the coffee machine, you, there would be a line, right? There's somebody that's next to get coffee. Uh, but you only see that once somebody breaks it, right? So, so it's, other than that, it just works as our everyday, uh, you know, dealings in the world. And uh, that's exactly what we're interested in. So we're interested in the things that are so everyday that we don't see them. Um, and uh, there's a German, um, uh, there's a German uh, filmmaker that made, called Wim Wenders that made a, made a, a movie called uh, Far Away So Close. And that's the whole point. It's so close to us that it's far away. Um, and it's because we can't think about those things all the time. You can't think about how do you stand in line. You just do it, right? Or how do you drive a car? If you, if you move to New York City, I moved to New York City, and I'm still trying to figure out how traffic works here. So people speed up at the wrong times and break it, and they get annoyed with me. I don't know why they get annoyed with me. Uh, a, 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 a space between two cars is, is an opportunity to get ahead and get to the, re, to the red light as fast as possible. Exactly, exactly. But so, so places have styles. And I guess in a couple of years, I might figure out how it works. And I'll start getting annoyed with people when they break those laws. But I don't think any of the people in the, in the system would ever think about what's the style of driving in New York City. It's just what happens, right? And, um, and that's exactly the object of study. So we study familiarity, how we're familiar with things. And familiarity withdraws 
in the same sense, the classic example is a hammer. Hammering, the last thing you want to do when you hammer is think about it, right? You want to be, f you will hit your, uh, your hand and so on. It's, it's, and and that, is, that is when hammers are most hammers, is when they're engaged with skillful people using it. That's when hammers reveal themselves. You can also look at the properties and say it has a wooden shank and a, and a metal blob at the end and so on. You can decode it from a natural science perspective, how much it weighs and so on. But it doesn't weigh anything except if it's too heavy, right? It's just perfect when you, when you, when you use it. And that, in that sense, the hammer withdraws from our experience. And hammering becomes the experience, in a sense, right? Does, does that answer the question? OK, good. So again, familiarity. All right, so I have a question from here. Um, so when I was listening to your talk, uh, first with the example of the kitchen, and later with the Lego example, I noticed that the examples were all very male-centric. You, they were about soccer. All the the kids in question were all boys. So, which made me think: like, when you're doing this process and you're asking about the why, how do you guard against um, your implicit biases, looking finding only part of the answer? So that's um, a methodological question that you can't get out of. And it's called the hermeneutic circle. It's basically, in order to understand something, you need to use yourself and your own experience. A, a, a Shakespeare comedy isn't funny unless you use your own experience, right? Because, yeah, well, that's obvious. Uh, so, so the way um, that, we, that we try to do this is to work with our biases, right? Be aware of them and try to adjust for them as much as you can, but accepting that you can never there is no view from nowhere when you study people. When you study quarks and atoms and bits and bytes or something like that, there is a view from nowhere. And the natural science is a pretty good example and a very successful example of that. But for human sciences, you're inside the interpretation yourself. So you have to work with it and be honest, basically, about your own biases and so on. Now, we, we just did a study about women and drinking, which are two very exciting uh, topics. Uh, <laughs> And we found that women are starting going out in places like Russia, China, Brazil, where they never, ever went out by the, with their friends and so on. And it turns out it freaks out the men. Uh, they, don't, they sit at home and don't know really what to do. Um, and a whole new culture is starting, uh, especially, around, especially in, in, in Asia. It's quite prevalent, and it's a whole new market and so on. Um, so it's not just men we, we, we study. I guess the examples were biased in that direction. But in that case, you need to, again, work with your own assumptions and your own biases as much as you can. Uh, and there is no view from nowhere. Yeah. In this when, when Christian talked, he talked about um, three things you need. And one of the last one was called nonlinear problem solving. And it basically means exactly what you are talking about now, which is you cannot take your own ideas out of the picture. That means this type of analysis will never be a completely 100% exact analysis of how it always will be. It will be a hunch about how something works. Like when you read, go in and see a movie and you talk about it afterwards, you have an interpretation of that movie. But what we are saying is if a company can have a conversation about that, about the customers they are serving, and, st and start making interpretations based on deep data, it's much, much better than having a numbers based on very thin data because it gives them an insight. But it, you have to place a bet. It's not like a one-to-one -one where you can say, oh, they all have red shoes. Let's make you red shoes. It's not like that. I hope that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah and, you can, and you can say that it, there's, there's, you know, you can go to school, right? And, and uh, you know, anthropology is a, is a tradition that's 100 years old, which is about understanding culture. Uh, and it's just like you wouldn't ask somebody that's not an engineer to build a bridge. It can be helpful to have that kind of training if you want to do cultural analysis. Uh, and, but that doesn't give them, anthropologists, a, a view from nowhere either in the sense of natural sciences. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, when you guys are working with leaders who are so focused on the bottom line, what's the persuasion conversation like to say, you're focused on this question, but the actual one is, like, why play instead of how do we make more money? So, it, first of all, it works. Yeah. That, that tends to help. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it's, 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 it feels intellectual to them. Mm -hmm. It feels 
uh, non-familiar. It doesn't feel familiar to start talking about lived experience in, in this kind of complex way. But if they're in enough trouble, mm -hmm. they tend to listen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so a healthy crisis is always a good, um, good sign. And, and you can say that the, the Lego company had at that point that we're talking about here lost around $300,000 a day for 10 years. That makes people start listening a little bit, right? It's, it's, and yeah. it's a private company, right? So it's, it's you know, uh, they were in trouble. So that tends I, to help. I also think we've experienced when we talk, especially to people pretty high up, that there's a kind of fatigue with the tools they have available, right? There's a fatigue with the way strategy is done, the over quantification of everything, the million PowerPoint show, how all the strategies end up with the same idea that we need to fight our core, we need to go into new areas, and we need to build capabilities. It's always those three things. It doesn't matter whether it's soap or tennis catches. It's the same strategy. And we can sense that there's a time that was with those kind of uh, um, discussions. And, the, the, and, and I think many leaders are looking for something new, something that is deeper and more inspirational, basically, I think. Yes. And I, I'd say I'm surprised by how complex thinkers some of these leaders are, actually, which is a nice thing, that, that once you are, if you are at that level, uh, there's a reason why you're at that level. And you can, you can, um, you have bandwidth enough to deal with many things at the same time. So, so yeah, so that's very positive in a sense. Thank you. You have a question. Uh, yeah, so my question is around thick data and, um, you know, I think we, you guys describe sort of uh, qualitatively sort of what it was, I guess, in, in, your, st in your own style. But, um, you know, before you had this dichotomy of like, it's not focus groups, it's not, you know, sort of explicit questions, a little more um, tacit or a little more uh, subtle. And I was wondering, you know, how do you go about collecting that thick data or like what's that process like? Mm. Because it seems more subtle and a little more responsive to the environment and, mm. um, you know, like for example, with with the playing with kids example, it wasn't um, just observing them or you know taking notes, but it was also the process of actually playing with them and um, maybe putting yourself in their shoes a little bit. So I was wondering if you have any sort of thoughts about that methodology on yeah. a larger scale. So, so uh, anthropology has developed a tool set called ethnographic um, data gathering uh, from the 1920s and on, and it's basically mis largely misunderstood in business today because it means in-house, in-context interviews, right? So interview is one thing and what we say and so on is important, but it's also important what we do. And so what we normally say is we're not interested in people, really. We're interested in worlds and a world is, has people in it for sure. So let's say the, the world of cooking or the world of business or the world of Google, they're all, or the um, art world. They all have, um, it's not a thing, the art world is not a thing. It consists of galleries and artists and pencils and paper and canvases and all sorts of things. But all, and it has roles in there, so people that feel they're artists and it has identities um, and it has money. It has all sorts of things. In order to understand a world, uh, you need a hook into that world. And the way we do that is through getting people and seeing how they, inv how they deal with things and how they do the things that they do. So they, it's not that they, they can, I mean, they always lie to themselves. We all lie to ourselves all the time uh, about, you know, I need to cook for my children all the time and then I can't find my pots and pans. You know, that's all a situation. Uh, and, uh, and we just tr try to cut through that by saying individuals are less interesting than worlds. The worlds are people. So what we study is not individuals, it's worlds. In, uh, so in a sense, Margaret Thatcher used to say there is no such thing as society, only individuals. We say the other way around. We say there is no such thing as individuals, only societies. You are what you do and the way you do it, but also because of all these other people that deeply influence you. And you might feel that you have rational decisions of what you do, but you don't. <laughs> you make all sorts of decisions because of your surrounding and because the world you're in. There's, just, there's Heidegger calls it the one. One does this and one does that. That's most of the time we do things because that's what one does. One gets up in the morning, one asks, asks questions when it's uncomfortable that nobody's asked questions. <laughs> that sort of situation, right? And, and that's exactly what we study. We study how people um, live in worlds and how those worlds interact with them, in a sense. So it's observational, uh, but it's with a f theoretical framework behind it, in a sense. Okay. Thanks. Does that, did that answer the question? Yeah, thanks.
Great, thanks. Good. Thank you.